Here you go. Okay, yeah, because I'm going to use two. I really want to, like, you know, I'm here for you guys. And uh, first of all, I want to thank Sweetwater for having me here. I mean, I, I came uh, to Sweetwater about a year ago for the first time when I was just blown away. And when I heard about GearFest and the opportunity to come here and be with you all, I said, yes, I'm here. So thank you all for coming. Thank you, Sweetwater. Thank you for Ampeg and Spectre for being my sponsors to be here. And I want to make this as interactive as possible. Uh, how many bass players do we have in the house? How many musicians do we have in the house? Uh, <laughs> I mean, there's a reason why I say this, because, you know, I am a bass player, and I identify myself as a bass player. But I started out as a musician. Actually, I started out as a fan of music, you know. And when I, in the very beginning, it's just like all of you guys, you know, I'm just like you guys. I started playing top 40 bands and playing all different styles and falling in love with different techniques and different bands and artists and so on. Then I moved to Los Angeles and I played in my very first real rock band, Quiet Riot. Yeah. So by then I became more focused on rock and roll rather than be able to play Motown and country and disco and funk and everything else. So began my journey as a rock bass player. And I, but I always kept in the back of my pocket, musical pocket, uh, different techniques that once in a while I have to bring out. I mean, I play with bands like right now I'm playing with the Guess Who. The band has been around since 1965. <laughs> so, you know, we play songs like Undone, which is kind of like a little jazzy, a little bossa nova. And then we go and play uh, American Woman, which is kind of like blues, bass, rock and roll. Prior to that, I played with, with Blois or Colt. Again, a very diverse band. I mean, just about every song sounds different from, from the other songs, you know. So that being in a top 40 band really helped me to start collecting different techniques. You know, and that's part of my musical journey. But then again, I just, through the 80s, I just was really focused in being a metal rock bass player. You know, somebody that really, you know, I, I could go on stage with Ozzy, then get off, get in the bus and listen to Weather Report because I grew up listening to that. You know, and it was like, wow, I mean, where can I fit a Jackal riff in a Ozzy song? And it was like, no way of doing that, you know. So I started thinking of being more a bass player. Okay, as a bass player, what's my role? How can I contribute to the band? Then later on, went back with Quiet Riot, you know, recorded the album Metal Health. I'm on the whole record except for two songs. That's uh, Metal Health and The One I Let You Go, which Chuck Wright recorded before I joined the band. But I'm one of the founding members, signed to the record deal, and of course, you know, went on tour and was part of the, that Metal Health legacy. And prior to that, I was, like I mentioned before, with Randy in the, um, that version of Quiet Riot. Then Ozzy, with Ozzy I recorded Tribute and I recorded Speak of the Devil. As a matter of fact, by the time I was done with the 80s, I had recorded on five consecutive multi-platinum records. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> recorded on Tribute, Speak of the Devil, Mental Health, Condition Critical, and Slip of the Tongue. With, uh, I was blonde then, so you might not remember me <laughs> <laughs> being a white snake, you know. Uh, so, yeah, I, I've been very blessed to play with some, some of the best musicians. Some, some of them are here at GearFest. Steve Vai, one of them, you know, incredible, incredible musician. Musician, exactly. Because every time I used to get together with Steve, we talk music. Because here I am, you know, just like I did with Randy. Randy helped me so much when I joined the band, because he, you know, the, those records were done before Tommy Aldridge and I joined the band, you know, Blizzard of Oz and Dire of the Mad Men. So he's explaining to me like the whole concept, I had the whole journey that he had musically from going to Blizzard to Diary, because if you listen to those two records, they're very different, but they were recorded within months. And there was a certain, uh, almost a strategy of approaching the compositions, how they were recorded, how everything was actually thought out. 
With Blizzard, it was actually more diatonic, which brings me to my friend, the circle of fourth and fifths, right here. Are you guys, how, how many of you are really, really familiar with the circle of fourths and fifths? Great. I can say, you know, this, this has been around since the 1600s, way before the GPS on your iPhone <laughs> was available. And it's the same thing. Like if you wanna, if you wanna find a destination modally, you know, whatever mood, because we actually, we play moods, we play feelings. And so we choose what key, is it a minor, is it a major, augmented, diminished, whatever. And it's all here. This is your GPS to get from one mood in a song to another mood, because it's all about tension and release when we play music. And this is, this is the, the, the GPS right here. But one of the things that I really wanted to point out that I'm actually gonna show you by playing it, is what is considered diatonic. How many of you are, are familiar with the modes and diatonic and, and all of that? Okay, for the rest of you, this is how it goes. The, the way that this circle of fourths and fifths, now when I say fourths and fifths, is because if you go in this direction, this is like the tuning on a guitar or a bass. G is the dominant to C, and then you have the uh, the Lydian, which is F, and it just keeps going like that in fours, going in this direction. If you're playing an instrument like the mandolin or the violin, it goes in fifths, this direction right here, the tuning. I mean, or the you know playing from one fret to the other, on the same you know different strings going down the frets. Okay, so the way that. As a, I mean, I, I have certain apps that I can actually flip this, and the force will be going in that direction. But just to make it clear, I, I did this uh, screen capture on the app that has that has the circle of fifths going this way, and the fourth. Okay, and they're called perfect fourth and fifths because if you flip them, the fifth is actually a fourth coming from the octave. If you play a G behind the C on the guitar, from the C to the G, that's a fourth, flipped. But if you go from the uh, C to the G, that's a fifth. You go four notes down, you go uh, C, B, A, G, that's a fourth, right? So that's going in this direction. The other direction, it takes five notes to get to the, to the fifth above. So it's really a perfect system that Pythagoras figured that out thousands of years ago, and he was the one who came up with the perfect octave, fourth, and fifths. So anyway, so getting to the diatonic, let me see if I can get this, ah, here we go. Okay, all of these notes are diatonic, including the B right here, which is part of the Locrian, diatonic to the key of C. C is the one, and if you notice here, they go minor, right? So relative, relative minor, Major, minor, major, minor, major. Okay, one of the things that's really interesting for triads, you have a C, and then you got the G, which is the fifth, and the minor, it's actually, it's the major triad from the C to the E, but it's actually, it's a minor triad. You go C, E, G, that's a major, major C, C major. But with this E down here, it's actually, it's, it's a minor triad. If you combine all of these, you have the C scale, all these notes right here. Also, not only that, you start getting into the pentatonics. If you have D minor, A minor, E minor pentatonic put together, you're actually spelling out the C major chord. And that is one of, yeah, as a matter of fact, let me show it to you guys, what it, what it looks like and what it actually sounds like. Would you kiss me, hello, test, one, two, one, two. Ah, here we go. Which actually gives me an opportunity to show off my new Spectre signature bass with a little light show right here. These are the Sims pickups. 
this is my signature bass, and there's certain features that I'm going to talk about in a little bit, but I don't want to lose focus of uh, what I was going to show you guys up here. And uh, anyways, let me see. Okay, I'm going to play for you guys combinations of pentatonic minors because, uh, you know, if you have the combination of one of the least used things in music, which is the circle fourth and fifth, and one of the most overused things in music, which is the pentatonics, you're going to have a perfect combination because you're going to be able to apply them both together and take you places musically that you might have never gone before. And it's always been right under your fingertips. And this is how you get there. OK. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play in the key of C, kind of to reflect what's up on the board. So let's say you do the D minor, which is the Dorian. Uh, you guys familiar with the modes? What modes are basically positions in a scale. Very simple. It's n it's not just about the major and minor modes. Everything has you know most scale well, most scales have modes. It's just starting points. Okay. So let's say in the key of C, the second note is D, which is a D minor. And it's the second. You know, like if you're looking at the Nashville system, it's all done by numbers, which actually makes sense. So you don't have to remember all of these. Uh, and I'm sorry, you know, Greek words. <laughs> How many times do you say Dorian in your daily life? <laughs> okay, so basically Dorian is the second position in the key of C major, right? So let's say we're playing C. C. This is Dorian. But the pentatonic, now one of the interesting things about every single pentatonic is that you're missing a combination of tritones because tritones, they're so dominant Maybe that's where the word dominant seventh comes from. It's because your ear, every time your ear hears this, it leads you somewhere. There's a lot of uh, uh, tension going on that your ear is going to go, uh, we're going, you know, this, this is not the end of the song. It's going to go somewhere. And it usually goes to, you know, the, uh, the one from the fifth right here. But when you play pentatonics, like you know, minor or major pentatonics, there's no combination of, of tritones, which makes, makes it very ambiguous. You know, it could be, that's why you can actually play a minor pentatonic over a major chord, because it's not, it's a lot of, it sounds really good and it's very ambiguous to the tone center of it. It just, so let's say, so let's say if you're playing D, That's D dominant. You can. See, it's there's no tritone going, uh, taking you to the D minor and and the pentatonics. That that would be a minor pentatonic. And this will be a major. Also, you can combine them. That, that would be a hybrid pentatonic scale, basically, because uh, what, you, what you're doing is you're, 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 you're bringing in your major pentatonic and superimposing in the same key, let's say I'm doing playing in D, the D minor pentatonic with the D major pentatonic, this is very popular in playing the blues, basically. Or just, a, just about any musical content, you can apply this. And it sounds correct to the ear. It sounds inside, it's not really outside yet. Because if you, when you really wanna go outside, you basically, you have four notes that you can alter, which is basically, let's say, you're doing a D dominant, 
And then all you have to do is actually play a minor pentatonic above, you know, step and a half above on the minor. So you go. Because you're actually, you're, you're altering the ninth and the third and the fourth and the fifth right here. And you're keeping your dominant triad, which is the, uh, the, the root, the major third, and the tritone stays exactly the same in your job. And it adds that tension, you know. And, what, and any time that you add tension, you want to resolve right back somewhere. It doesn't necessarily have to be back to the root. As a matter of fact, if let's say I'm playing this D, I can actually make a shell chord. A shell chord, uh, for those who might not be familiar with a shell chord, is you play a chord and you leave out the root of the chord. In this case, let's say, and the best way to find out is at this right here, this position, it's going to be the fifth of the fifth, right? So it's a, so th this is your fifth chord, which is actually so. Right here. So I'm leaving, I'm leaving out the the D root, and all this is what you're getting. You're getting the fifth, the minor third, and the major third. I'm sorry, the, the minor seventh. Uh, <laughs> okay. Okay, now this is a minor six triad also, which is its equivalent to what it, the Dorian would be. This, this is C6. I can even put a seventh, major seventh in there. But I just wanted to give you a relationship of what this chord can do for you. So again, going back to the shell chord that also we call it, this is a, a also a shell chord of the uh, diminished seven. Right, so this chord, you can use it since it's got two tritones. And I'm going to show you how it works with the uh, circle of fourths and fifths up there. You can, you can take this chord and resolve it. This is the G. This is the uh, uh, first inversion of a G chord. So it goes to the G. So the, from a D, this is actually a a shell chord of a D7, which will lead you naturally to a G major. Just by moving one of the tritones down, right? And then I'm gonna I'm gonna use the the other tritone in here. This will bring you to an E major. If you actually you if you go down with this chord. It will lead you to four different major chords and four different relative minor chords that are related to, to the chord D, D7. And your ear tends to lean towards the G major as being the tone center because it's basically a shell chord of a dominant, dominant seven. So your ear can actually, you know, it feels more comfortable to go to that G major than anything else, but you have options to go to other places. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back to my friend the circle of fourth and fifth. By the way, at home, this is what I do. Yes, I'm, I'm known for getting up on stage, you know, with, with 
arena bands and just like banging my head and stuff like that, playing really loud. But at home, I have a very small amplifier next to me, and I plug my bass. It's always within reach. I drink. I get up in the morning, make coffee, make my breakfast, grab the bass, go to YouTube, and explore new information. I mean, there's, there's, I mean, there's no excuse as a musician not to expand your knowledge of music nowadays. You know, back in the day, I used to go on the road for about a year and a half, and I'm talking about the 80s, a year and a half on the road, and if I really wanted to get an education, I would have to like put my career on hold and go to MIT, BIT, or whatever. I don't have to do that anymore. First of all, my wife will kill me, <laughs> if I, you know. But second of all, no, I don't. And, and I don't have to do it, neither do you, if you really want to expand your musical knowledge, because there's incredible teachers. One of them that I, that I, that I visit a lot is Tim Pierce. He's got a wonderful YouTube channel, and he's here today. You can ask him all about that. And these, you know, these incredible musicians, just like myself, we love sharing knowledge because it just makes music, makes our world better, you know, to have better music, especially from the new generation of musicians, right? You know who you are. Because <laughs> we need great music in our lives, just like we've had so far, and then we're just a matter of keeping it going, you know. So anyways, let me, let me go back to this, um, this pizza or, or this clock. By the way, if you, if you think it looks like a clock, it's because it's the Sumerians. Again, I'm, throwing, I'm dropping a lot of names here, well, people that I never met, you know. The Sumerians, them from back 5,000 years ago before Plato visited their, their land and brought that knowledge back to, back to Greece, you know, and started naming the modes after Greek names and, and pizza, you know, ingredients. <laughs> they figure it out, and it was all based on the zodiac signs. What you're really playing is zodiac music. So if, it's, if it gets a little spacey out there, you know, a little trippy, it, you're doing it right. <laughs> because it's supposed to be that, you know. But if you look at it, it's a clock. It's 12 notes. That's all we got, 12 notes, you know. But then again, we have 12 hours in the day. How much can you do in 12 hours? A lot of stuff, you know. And it's, since it's by fifths, 12 by five is 60. We got 60 minutes, 60 seconds, you know. So there is a mathematical logic to the mu to music because it's all based on s waves, sound waves, and notes. So you know, if, for those of you who are accountants, you could, you're going to really enjoy playing because it's all about you know think of notes as money, basically, <laughs> you know, <laughs> because it's numbers, you know, and they're all connected. Uh, have you guys ever ever seen the John Coltrane Circle of, of Fifths? Actually, the mu uh, music of the spheres. It's the most amazing. He's able to connect every single note to every note and just make it into a continuous chain of melody. You know, he figured that out and he passed it down to Yusef Latif, his his you know his reed playing you know friend. And all of this information is on the internet if you guys are really interested. You know, you you re guys really look interested in this. So I'm gonna. <laughs> I'm going to keep talking about this until I empty the room. <laughs> so I'm going to put this down, and I'm going to start talking about this circle of fifth here, and um, hopefully you guys can use it to navigate. But before we do, we do that, I want to show you about what I was talking about being diatonic, right? One of the songs, actually, during the Blizzard of Oz tour, I played a few songs that were actually written diatonic. Diatonic means that every single chord in the tone center is used in the song. You know, so let's say songs like Mr. Crowley, it's actually every single chord in F major, which is D minor, relative minor, is played in the song, including the circle of, of fourths at the end. Uh, I'm gonna show you. I love this bass, and of course, what better amp to have this bass with than, than the, an amping? 
I've been playing. As a matter of fact, I'm going to play with Ozzy. I had a wall of Ampeg amplifiers, and it's just like to match Randy's wall of Marshalls and Ozzy's wall of, of monitors, and it, it was just nuts. But it was the greatest feeling in the world. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, anyways, getting back to, uh, so let's say Mr. Crowley, just to break it down to show. I mean, uh, how many, how many of you guys figure it out that this is diatonic, Mr. Crowley? Anybody out there? Yeah, figure it out. Okay. But that's because I, I run into you in the hallway and I told you about it, right? Now. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So, let me see. Uh, yeah, by the way, if you guys are digging the little lights, uh, the lights represent different pickup configurations. So the blue is a um, humbucker, the green is a single coil, and the red, the sexy red, it's a uh, sexy split pickup, like a, like a precision bass. This is the, uh, the girl's favorite. As a matter of fact, if you have like all red, girls will come to you, talk to you after the show. So this, it's really a plus having this, this bass, trust me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the variety of tones you can get with this is just nuts. You know, you can go. Okay. So, so the, uh, the ending of, uh, of uh, Mr. Crowley goes from a D minor, which is the, the relative of the F. To a, to, a, to a G minor, to the C, which is the uh, which is the dominant, to the uh, to the F, and then it goes to a B flat, then it goes to the E, which is an E locrian, which basically you can do a melodic uh, s um, melodic minor on it, like. To an A Phrygian. So basically, and it goes round and round, you know. So I, I just, when I started playing the song, I was hitting wrong notes because I wasn't playing the correct modes within the scale. And then Randy had to like explain to me, like, oh, okay, this is what, this is what you're doing wrong, you know. So, you know, having that knowledge is really, really gonna help you, you know, to actually stay away from hitting the wrong notes, especially if you're not playing jazz. If you're playing jazz, you can say, hey, I'm playing an alteration here. You know, it's <laughs> supposed to be like this. But in heavy metal, eh, not, not so much. You know, so going back to another of Randy's compositions, what I really wanted to show you is, it, and I do this as an exercise at home, I want to keep everything within a pentatonic, let's say. <laughs> And I'm gonna play chords, triads, basically, triads, little triads. So let's say uh, Goodbye to Romance, which is in D major. A D major, then I do the uh, seven. Basically, I'm, I'm taking the, the D down. And then I'm gonna go the B minor. And I'm gonna put a seven just to make it sound a little jazzier because I can. Because I can actually do it as a, as a just as a regular minor chord, but do like you know just a little flair to it, and then add like uh, the F minor seventh, and it's I'm staying within this penta minor pentatonic, and I'm able to do this because this is all diatonic to all to F to D. Which are, and these are just, uh, you know, actives. So these are just octave of, of, the, of these extra notes, but uh, th this is all I need to play that. So I'm just doing just in some inversions, right? So let's say we were in the, uh, and then uh, G, G third inversion, and then the dominant. And I haven't left this, these uh, three, three frets right here. You know, it's all built in. Like, because like I mentioned before, it's all diatonic. So I'm, I'm gonna show you. You see up there? Well, it's actually we're in the key of C. But one of the great things you can actually do is transpose it quickly. Because I'm, we're here in D. 
I'm gonna go to C now. So I'm gonna play exactly the same movements in the key of C. So I start C, a C major. And you can go up, down, up and down the neck just using the, the same things. <laughs> but you know, this is all stuff that's available, you know. I mean, there's, there's certain things that I discover on my own because I'll, I'll like wake up in the morning and go, oh, what about if I go from here to there? And it's like a, once you're in a certain discovery trajectory about music, which is what really, you know, by the end of us doing this, I, this is what I really would love for you guys to, to take with you about the being able to expand not only by getting knowledge that's available online, but also making your own discoveries. Because these are discoveries that you can actually apply to what you're doing musically. Because, yeah, you can go online and, you know, spend a week learning something that you're never going to able, be able to use as a composer or a musician in your own band. But if you start finding things that you can learn and apply to what you're doing in your own music every single day, that's, to me, that's worth everything. Because now you're going to be able to put it to use, whether it's by sharing it with other people like I'm doing here today with you all, which I really appreciate you coming here, or by writing music that applies to everything that you're learning now. You know, you're going in a certain direction. Like if you listen to, you know, go back to your favorite bands that you grew up with. I'm one of those guys that my favorite era in music is the 70s. You know, Yes, Kansas, ELP, Weather Report. These guys were very knowledgeable about music. There was not a single musician there that had no idea what they were doing, you know, with their instrument. And as composers and as, and as, and as players, you know. And um, as it happens, you know, there, we went through a certain era in the 80s that a lot of that did not, was not necessary, <laughs> you know, you know. Uh, I started playing in the 60s, and I, like I mentioned before, I, 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 got a, I learned a lot. I, I went to college. I went to college, and actually, I was learning faster by, by playing in bars and having to like, listen to records and make, uh, you know, transcribe what was going on and learn those really quickly by ear. And I'm talking back in the day when you had to drop the needle on the record and keep dropping until my mom or dad yelled at me, you know, stop doing that, you're gonna break the record player, you know. In Spanish, which is even harsher, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and that's how I learned, really quickly, you know, because I don't wanna get yelled at. It was like, okay, you're gonna get three, three passes at this song and you better pick up everything, you know. And um, so yeah, they, these are all part of education. As, as a musician, I mean, I love to watch new musicians, guys I've never heard of, because they always have a different slant on, on music and technique. I mean, as bass players, I mean, when I first started out, it was basically one guy playing with one thumb. Of course, it happened to be James Emerson, one of the greatest bass players in all time, you know. But he played with one thumb, and so did Jack Bruce, you know, one finger, 
one finger, yeah, and sometimes they would use the thumb to mute the string, you know, or put it on top of that cover that we'll remove as soon as we get an instrument, you know. It's like, <laughs> and, uh, and we've gone from that to like, these guys are playing like, you know, they look like they got 20 fingers on, on the bass, you know, it's like, oh my God, it's incredible, you know, how far the instrument has really grown you know, and gone as far as techniques, you know. And there's always a need to gravitate towards something like that if you can apply it to your band or start a band to use techniques like that. You know, we, we just, we, there's nothing wrong with that. Some, some of the greatest groups have musicians like that. I mean, it's, it's like, let's say Billy Sheehan, for example. You know, it's, he's, he's able to play like Billy because he's in bands that musically fits in perfectly you know it's that they're put together for that type of style you know and it's just wonderful you know i mean I, i've had to be very uh cautious to adapt my playing to different uh styles to fit the band because you know i I gotta feed my family, <laughs> and I want to play. You know, I want to play in front of a lot of people. You know, and I, I and I'm a fan of music. I've been doing this for a long time. So yeah, so playing with classic rock bands is is fantastic because it's this the soundtrack of my life. You know, and, but uh, but yeah, whatever situation suits you all, as far as being able to develop your technique, and and what makes you happy as a musician. You know, I, I, I f I've left situations in my life at the very top of their career just because I lost the joy of being in that situation. There's nothing worse than playing in front of thousands of people and, and whatever element w existed before is not there anymore and there's a certain loss and the biggest loss you're gonna have is the loss of musical joy. You know, so I, 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 I don't take that lightly at all. You know, every move that I've ever made to go from this place to this place is all based on my musical happiness, you know. Yeah. How, how much more time do we have before we, we do the Q&A? Uh, yeah, I, okay, so, so quickly, let me, let me wrap up this up because, uh, as a matter of fact, this, this app that I, that I did a screen capture from is called Circle of Fifths. It's available on iTunes for free. And the great things about these apps is that you can transpose the key. Right now it's in the key of C, you know, but you can transpose it to whatever key you need and start exploring and, and uh, you know, just you know, find out musically what emotions you want to create by shifting tone centers, even if it's momentary. You know, going from a C major to a C minor that, and borrowing chords from that, that just gives you a whole different emotion to the song. That's what all the great composers did. I'm going to give you, <laughs> God, I wish I had more time. Uh, I'm going to give you a very quick example here. Like, let's say a song like, um, here, there, and everywhere. Beatles song, right? Go back to bass. So I'm going to do it in F, F major. And we're gonna go to, to the bridge. See that, it's what McCartney did, he borrowed from the minor, the relative, you know, the parallel minor of F major. So he went into F major, I mean, from F major to F minor. But instead of going to F minor, from going from this, he went to the, uh, the, the third. The relative major of the minor, okay, which is A flat. So it so he goes to A flat first major, then he goes to the minor. Is 
and this this C dominant here is it works with either F major and F minor. So it, this is a very important chord. And then it goes back to the F minor, right? To B flat minor. And this dominant that can either bring you here, but it's not gonna do that. It's gonna go to back home to the tone center, which is F major. Right, so this is techniques like this have been applied in the soundtrack of your life, basically songs that you've been hearing all your lives, and you go, "Wow, that was beautiful," and you might not realize what it is, but it is going drawing from the parallel minors, and I'm going to show you some more stuff right here, really quickly, and then we do the Q and A. Thank you. So basically going to, let's say what we're just talking about, let's say you're in the key of C major and you find the minor right here because, okay, E flat major is the C minor, right? It's right here. And if you notice, this is surrounded in blue. These are, this is, this becomes the parallel minor of this, of, of this, of this, uh, uh, Tone center, basically, it's divided into really into four tone centers. Okay, this is the parallel minor, C major, C minor. This is E flat major up here. The the outer circle is the major. All of these are major. In this direction, going in fourths, these are all major going in fifths. In this direction, right here, right now below, you got the the relative minor, E major, relative minor, which means it's the Let's say this is the one, that was, this would be minor six, the what is called aeolian in Greek. And it's also one of the ingredients in Greek pizza. Yeah, <laughs> with mushrooms and aeolian right here. Okay, C minor, right? Okay, and then you go in this direction, this becomes the major of the minor, relative minor. Right here, this is the C, relative minor, this is the aeolian, this is the major. Relative minor of the major, F sharp minor, of course. And this is the fun territory right here. And if you notice, this is what has the most tension because C having no flats or sharp, no matter, no matter what key, let's say if you're in the key of, of E flat, still if you play a C chord, it's not gonna have any, any flats or sharps. That's it, that's the way it's in if you look at the piano, all the white keys, they're all part of the C scale. No flats or sharp, which is what flats or sharps really indicate. The, sharp, the black keys, basically, is what it is. I mean, but you, you can have sharp or the keys, you know, too. Okay, here we go. Uh, blah, 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 blah. So going here in this territory, this is where the tritones live. And this is where the fun stuff is right here. And what's really interesting is that if you have an E flat minor and G flat, which is F sharp, if you go this way, you, you have C, E flat, A, G flat, which is F sharp. This one right here, but this, this is the a major version of it. Okay, if you go like just the up and down, you have the C major, A, and just look at it as the A. Okay, one, two, three, four, four different tone centers divided by basically three major notes divide, uh, multiplied by four. You got 12, right? So you got this, uh, the C, the A, and then the E, if you look at it as just an E major, is the E flat right here, E flat, E flat, and G sharp, um, and you got the G sharp, which is this F sharp right here. So all the tritones not only live here, but they also live right here. And again, what you really want to do once in a while is to do, uh, you know, to alter the chords. The best way to do it is by leaving the, let's say if you're playing a dominant chord, the, the, the third and the dominant seventh. Leave those, up, uh, including the, the root, 
don't alter those, but alter everything else. Or you don't even have to alter everything. You can just alter the ninth, flat the ninth, or keep your major third with a ra sharp, sharp ninth. You know, it's very bluesy sounding, you know, which is part of that hybrid blues scale that I was showing you guys at the very beginning. I think we're going to jump into the uh, Q&A now. Dino? Oh, are you ready for the Q&A? I mean, uh, or is, or is Andrew going to do the Q&A? Oh, yeah. Okay. Sounds good to me. I love this. Okay. Uh, do we have any questions? It could be about anything. It doesn't have to be about... Yes. What's your name? Uh, Mick. Mick? Yes. And your question is, I mean, so everybody can hear it. Do you have a warm-up routine? And if so, what does it consist of? A, a warm-up routine. Oh, man, that's a really good question because I really don't have a routine. It's kind of like uh, I, I wake up and I, I get ideas. Or if I don't have anything, if I need some inspiration, I go online and I have this feed that starts giving me whatever you know the people that i subscribe to have posted new uh new videos on youtube my to go uh site is scott divine base which is a uh, uh, base centric but all these professors i call them professors because they they teach at such a high level musically they are they share knowledge and they do it so precise and so clear never making you feel like you're you're stupid <laughs> because you don't happen to know this this piece of information because after all you're just discovering something that already exists that's all they're not inventing this it's a discovery you know just like we all do you know on our own we can actually do this if we really set our minds to it you know just discovering new new things you know um uh, scott divine uh rick beato everything music jens larson jazz and uh kenneth kent hewitt for keyboards i i i go to sites uh that are for sack for read saxophone i spend more time reading treble clip than i do uh bass clip because that's where all the cool alterations happen to be, you know, chords and all, all the fun stuff, you know, yeah. Uh, so that, that's what I do. That's my daily routine. I, and I do that I I even on the road. I, I'm in my room with my bass and I'm just, I'm just playing, just, and things that I might not be able to apply immediately, but it just fulfills me musically. You know, it gives me a lot of joy. <laughs> uh, any questions? Yes. What's your name? Um, like uh, in the videos, like uh, after hours and like laughing gas, you you seem to like hit the bass a lot and like you know put your hand over the neck. Like where did you adapt that from? Okay. Uh, yeah, I I started playing clubs about ten years before you saw that video, and when I was playing clubs in Miami, meant that we started playing like around eleven o'clock at night because and back in the day nobody left the house before 11 or midnight, you know? And uh, we ended, you know, we did five, six sets a night. 45 minutes on, 15 off. And I had to entertain myself. You know, I mean, there's, you know, make it fun, make it challenging. So I started playing upside down, behind my neck, behind my back, just to keep myself awake around four o'clock in the morning, <laughs> you know? And that's why I did that. And then they became a shtick. And then they became part of me, and this is what I do. And I, I do different things with different bands. You know, I got, like licking my fingers when I played, playing in Miami. I had, uh, I mean, I've been playing back in the late 60s and 70s, early 70s, late 60s. We didn't have roto sound distribution in Miami yet, which meant that all our strings were flat wound. Now, if you have the heat and the sweat, if you're coming home around 5, 6 o'clock in the morning, the last thing I want to do is pull the bass out of the trunk and bring it inside the house. I would just leave it in the trunk, baking in 120 degree Miami weather, you know. And from the sweat from the night before, they would get moldy and, and, and yeah, it was like playing barbed wire. So I just started licking my fingers just to get 
something out of it. This is before I discovered boiling strings. I used the Adarios, the best strings in the world, but I still boil them because I don't like to abuse you know, the endorsements. So I get multiple shows out of each set. You know, but I, I actually I prefer boiled strings because they're more supple. They, they're broken in, basically. And when you boil them, it's kind of like boiling surgical instruments. You're getting all the gunk out and you know, s sanitize them. But it's really to get the hairspray out of the, <laughs> of the, of the strings. Trust me. <laughs> so on the road, let's say when I was touring with White Snake, I would bring like a like a, a burner, plug it in, and and a little little pot, and put boil the water and stick strings in there. That's yes, that's what I that's what I did every week because I would collect them, and then then like on Sundays or Mondays, whatever the gig was, I would boil the strings and let them dry and put them put them back on. Uh, anybody? Yes, I'll hold that. So, um, a lot of musicians were born in Indiana, like David Lee Roth and Axl Rose and Mick Mars, but they traveled to LA and they became famous there. And so that happened to a lot of bands in the 80s and then in the early 90s, a lot of Seattle bands. Do you think it's changed in the modern day, especially with the internet, that do you think location matters to become a famous and successful band? That, that's a really great question. I, I have to say uh, yes and no. I mean, I live in LA. I've been there since the uh, mid 70s. I went there to network with, with the rest of the musicians that came from all over the world to network because it wasn't just American musicians. I mean, there were musicians from England that actually moved to Los Angeles and the, all everybody used to hang out at the Rainbow Bar and Grill. And that's where you network. And these English musicians, even though they might have been in successful bands in England, they moved to LA to find more musicians, you know? And uh, that's how I joined Choir Raya with Randy. And uh, that's how I, Randy recommended me to, uh, to play with Ozzy. But once I, since 1981, it's rare, rarely do I play in Los Angeles. I live there, but I really don't play there. I, I played about two and a half hours away from LA last weekend. That's it. I might not play for the rest of the year so close to my house, you know, because all my gigs, and, and I, I'm out with the guests who just about every week, but they're all, all over the country. Yeah, so it's not really necessary. Right now, if anybody wants to move somewhere, I would recommend Nashville because that's where that seems to be the new LA sort of network, network. And I don't think it's necessarily to play in Nashville as much as it is to meet people that can actually, you know, you, be, you join their band and then you go on the road and play somewhere else, not necessarily in Nashville. Yeah, unless you're playing in a club circuit. When I was playing in Miami back in the, the early 70s, there were so many clubs, Miami and Fort Lauderdale. I mean, it was incredible. A lot of musicians that I knew did not want to leave Miami and leave that lifestyle because they were doing really well, and so was I. But I wasn't happy just being in a, in a bar band. I didn't want to do that. You know, I, I wanted to be a, a recording artist. You know, so that's why I traveled to LA and was a starving musician before I wasn't starving <laughs> anymore. <laughs> yeah. uh, questions? Uh, yes, sir. Oh, yeah, I got it. Oh, one more? Okay. Okay. Make it a good one. <laughs> this is for all of the unknown songwriters, and um, I'm one. Um, as an unknown songwriter, how do I get my music to people who would want to record my music so I can basically get royalties? <laughs> Have you heard of Spotify? <laughs> you know, I, I, I think anything that you do with music, you, I, I don't think music, if you want to be successful, money should be the, the, your, your goal. It should be because you have no, no other choice but to write songs. Look at Mark Carney. You know, he writes a song every single day, according to him. It's not because of the money. It's because he needs to write. You know, I need to play. I need to like 
make music, you know, and explore things. And it's not because of money, but I'm doing it and, and nobody's watching or listening. I'm just on my own. Sometimes my little dog is next to me. <laughs> yeah, she likes certain certain songs. <laughs> so I play those for her, you know. Uh, but yeah, I mean, do it because you love music, not because if you're trying to, you know, make money, because th then you're not chasing the real purpose of what music is all about, you know, which is the joy of, of making other people happy, not just yourself, because every time you write a song and somebody connects with it, it's their song now. You might be collecting the royalties, but that song belongs to that to that person because it's part of their life. <laughs>